how long have you and Mr. Bowman been married? 56 years. We have always done everything together. You know, we just, you know, I went to all his plays when he was teaching and we were always together, you know, when we traveled. Fortunately, I have a very strong, wonderful wife. I was a teacher for 43 years. I taught uh, some history, some sociology, but mostly theater arts. I was a director. Uh, when we retired and came here, I became a director, uh, a playwright, um, a set designer, a, co a costume designer. I really, truly enjoyed the UIL activities of judging debate and forensics and one at plays. They hired Jim to rebuild the program. And so he went back after he retired and he said, I'll give you two years. Would you state your name for the record, please? Ellen Boyle Duncan. And are you a doctor, Ms. Duncan? I am. Um, what kind of doctor are you? I am board certified in anesthesiology and pain medicine. It in front of you, which is uh, Exhibit 5, the large binder, uh, what does it reflect about when Mr. Bowman actually arrived at North Central Baptist Hospital? I can tell you that there's a form in here that is, is dated or is timed the next morning at 0140. So that is a little before two o'clock at night. Um, Mr. Bowman is signing forms at the hospital, North Central Baptist, correct? It appears so. You were using expressions like, oh God, I would hope not. Hopefully they can get him there in two. Um, is because you had concern for the patient, correct? Yes. Um, this is a situation that you knew through your experience and training might result in paralysis uh, for the patient, correct? Yes. Um, and what you believed was the reasonable thing to do was get him treatment as soon as you possibly could, right? Yes. What would have been the ideal time to have performed the evacuation procedure on the hematoma that had developed with Mr. Bowman? Immediately after the event. And what's the next best time from a reasonable medical perspective to perform the surgery? As soon as possible. Is it common for a physician such as yourself, an anesthesiologist, to ask the hospital staff to contact you when the patient does arrive? Objection. Yes. All right. And do you rely on that for that to happen yes. before you go and see the patient? Apologize. Yes. Is Again, you can't operate on a patient who you don't know is there. That, that's a problem. It's, it's, it's unfortunate, but it is a problem and that we encounter with some regularity. And, and of course, um, uh, that part of it uh, is something that as doctors you believe is uh, something you would expect as standard of care from the hospital to notify you. Uh, when a patient arrives, uh, yes, we expect to be notified when the patient arrives. And I would expect the ER doctor to notify my doctor when the patient arrives. I don't understand. When I talked to him, he said he was going to tell them to call him as soon as Jim got to the hospital. And so I thought somebody from emergency would call him. And 
I guess obviously nobody did. Pain. Uh, that's pretty much it. I'm trying to understand uh, why if, if this is the case, why was I only on the bottom half from my waist down and nothing above my waist? So it was just kind of, I kept telling uh, my wife and, and other people that uh, I'm in pain and I'm scared. Mostly I'm scared. I, I think I was in so much pain, uh, it did, didn't cross my mind. I just myself kept thinking, something's got to get done, something's got to get done. And I was not aware that he was not going to be there. You've stated previously that as an internal medicine uh, doctor, it's your expectation that if you uh, issue an order or a standing order for the nursing staff to turn the patient uh, every two hours, uh, that you expect that order to be carried out, correct? I do. And failure to carry out that order puts the patient at risk of injury and even perhaps an infection that could cause death. It, it, that is a potential outcome, yes. Uh, while you were there, were you uh, turned regularly by the nurses? Not regularly, no. Were you ever shown pictures of what your wound looked like? Eventually, yes, when I asked for them. And what did your wound look like by the time uh, you were shown pictures of it? It was uh, black around the edges, uh, a dark red down, and I was sure that I could see the bone. When you were being treated for this condition over those months, how did you feel generally? What was the, what was the condition of your body? I was tired. Uh, I was tired of not getting turned uh, all the time. I do say uh, the night staff was very uh, Great on that. They, they did turn me every two hours. Um, I just was tired. Uh, I think more emotionally tired than anything else, just kind of thinking, uh, is this the rest of my life that I'm going to have to deal with this 24-7? The, the internist, Dr. Bala, uh, issued the orders uh, along with a hospital generated order for the care and treatment of Jim Bowman's skin during his first hospital stay uh, at North Central Baptist, correct? Yes. And Mr. Bowman was at increased risk for development of pressure ulcers from your review of his chart, correct? Yes. You don't remember Mr. Bowman. I do not. Um, but anybody in his situation would have needed the nurses to perform the delegated standing orders uh, that are reflected here in Exhibit 3, page 1. If, they, if he met any of these criteria, which uh, I believe based on the Braden score, he would have, so yes.
uh, Section 3 nursing instructions, it states, if patient has a current pressure ulcer injury, um, the nurse is to notify physician for treatment orders. Um, is that something that the physicians, the internal medicine physicians, when you were chief of staff uh, at the North Central Baptist, did you depend on the nurses to report to you uh, any pressure ulcers that developed during the stay of a patient? Did I expect them to? Yes. Yes. Um, and how would they communicate that? What's the ideal way for a nurse to communicate to you as an internal medicine specialist that a patient now has a pressure ulcer? Uh, by paging me, notifying me directly. Because of the serious risk for infection and uh, continued uh, loss of skin integrity and even death, it's very important to get started with treatment on pressure ulcers early, correct? Correct. For that reason, the only acceptable method in your view for communicating to the physician is to make sure that you either have in-person communication or phone or some personal communication other than just an entry in a chart. Yes. yes. Um, in the center of that note, it states he had a deep tissue injury to his coccyx. It is red and purple in color and is with a small area size of a pea to the left buttock that looks like a pop blister or skin tear, correct? Yes. And that is uh, consistent with him having developed a pressure ulcer uh, during his stay at North Central Baptist, correct? I couldn't say based on that description. That's one possibility. Um, you know from review of the medical chart that in fact he did develop a pressure ulcer, correct? Yes. Uh, at North Central Baptist before his transfer to Peterson, correct? Yes. Um, it goes on to state, patient states he is tired of being on his bottom. Um, that would be uh, inconsistent at least with him uh, having fought the nurses to try to uh, stay laying on his bottom, correct? Objection Not necessarily. Four. I would think he's tired of being paralyzed. I would take it that way, too. Um, at least one thing that can happen from not being turned off of your bottom is a deep tissue injury to the coccyx, which is in that general area of the body, correct? The coccyx is the tailbone area, the top of the gluteal fold. Which that area, right in, in the middle. In common speech, someone might refer to that as their bottom, correct? Yeah. What expect to have happen from the nursing staff is that they would uh, actually contact uh, one of the physician, physicians and let them know, the internal medicine physicians, that in fact the patient had developed pressure ulcer, correct? That would be ideal. That, and that's the standard that you expect of your nurses, correct? Yes. In your review of your notes related to the care of Jim Bowman, uh, there's no indication that any of the nurses ever reported to you that he had developed a pressure ulcer uh, when he was in the hospital, correct? There is no indication that they reported to me. Um, I believe that's correct. And there's no indication that they reported to 
at least from the discharge summaries and history and physicals of all the internal medicine doctors, there's no indication of a, uh, of a pressure ulcer in their records, correct? Uh, and the agent, the uh, history and physical admission um, and the progress notes I saw, there was no, in, uh, no um, indication of that. I don't recall seeing his discharge summary because I wasn't involved with that. The way to find out whether he was turned every two hours is that if he was, there should be an entry every two hours, correct? I would assume so. Uh, and it is fair the way that uh, you and the hospital uh, set policies for nurses, it is fair to expect that they will document when they carry out a physician's order, correct? Um, yeah, well, I don't know if it's, if it's fair to expect somebody to document something every two hours or if they can wait until the end of their shift to document it. I, I don't regulate what, how the nurses do their, do their work. work or documentation. But at some point during their shift, you expect them to have done and documented the, the turn every two hours, yes. correct? Yes. And you don't know one way or the other as we sit here today whether they did that with Mr. Bowman. Um, I did not see that, yes. You did not see turns every two hours, correct? Correct. At least reflected here in the discharge uh, summary, there's no indication here that there was a uh, pressure ulcer or deep tissue injury to the coccyx, correct? Correct. As the current uh, person in charge of internist for the region, which includes North Central Baptist on an administrative basis, um, you can't tell us whether a pressure ulcer staged at a three or a four is a never event, one that should never happen within one of your hospitals. In my opinion, it is something that should not happen, if that's what you're asking. And do you know if by regulation it's, an, it's something that should never happen? I do not. You use this term um, that you've become familiar with, debridement. Correct. Um, what is your understanding of what that actually is? Uh, that there is uh, bad tissue that needs to be removed so that the sore can heal faster and that they go in and, I want to say scrape, I'm not sure that's the, the correct term, but move around and remove all that. Removing tissue from your dead, body? Dead tissue, yes. When you're talking about this procedure to uh, try to fix uh, the wounds, um, one of the things you described was getting a catheter placed. Will you describe for the jury what that was like the first time? And, I, and it may be embarrassing, but I want you to tell the details. So when uh, he said you need to get a catheter, uh, we tried uh, the penile catheter first, and I was warned at that time that you may experience uh, the splitting of uh, the penis. And so we went ahead with it that way. Why, I don't know. Um, and uh, well, that, that came from uh, my urologist. And uh, we talked 
about it, and he said, well, you've got a couple choices. And he explained the one that would cause the split, and the other is a subcubic catheter. And looking, we tried the one first, and it, what it, happened? it split. What split? My penis from the top to down to maybe half an inch. So right How away. How did you feel as a man having that happen? Ooh, I didn't like it. Uh, I, I just don't like the idea. Of, and, I do, and I do have to say, due to all of this, uh, it has totally taken away my sex life. Uh, I have not had, if you excuse me, I have not had an erection since this all happened. Uh, it challenges your masculinity. My wife cannot do all the things that need to be done uh, for my care. What is the thing that you miss most about being here as opposed to being home? Oh, I would, I would love to be home uh, as long as I could be. Uh, as long as I could walk around the house and do what I want to do. Uh, we have talked extensively about what does the future bring uh, for us. Whether I like it or not, this is my home until the day I die. My wife cannot do all the things that need to be done uh, for my care. So. If, if you could hire someone to do the care, would you want to go home? Uh, yes, if I could afford it, it's ungodly expensive. It's really, I think we figured it out at the home care around here. I don't know about other areas. If we paid on a monthly basis with what they charge, it would be almost $15,000 a month. The big problem is that on the back of the house, there's this huge mungus, 10 foot wide, 60 foot long uh, porch that hangs out uh, kind of almost over the hill. We can see like for three miles from where we're living. And below that, there's a stone uh, patio. And then for that, then up against the fence, there's a flower garden and a couple of trees, and uh, those are the kind of things I like working with, tending, staying with the season, keeping the flower boxes up. So, golly gee. I think there's one other time. Uh, now we're talking out of, I mean, that's it out of, uh, is it three years? Three years, two months <laughs> that I've been home four times, maybe. How much time uh, do you currently spend at home? Zero. Would you like to have Jim home overnight? Oh, yes. I'd love to have him there full time. I mean, I'm up here every day from uh, 1230 until five o'clock every day.
that would have been it. He hasn't slept at home since a couple years ago. And were you and Jim uh, fond of going to those oh, performances yes. and things? When when did that stop? When he was paralyzed. To retire, to enjoy the beautiful hill country. We came, we explored the town, and I think the callow was the drawing card because, you know, they do all the plays and they have entertainment there all the time. They are busy every weekend. No, I think he's always had a real positive attitude, but um, he's gone through, like he has, he gets this terrible, terrible pain around his waist. And we have been to doctor after doctor, and nobody will say what it is, except they give him medicine for it that he can take every three to four hours. But sometimes that pain is so severe. and You'll have to ask him about it, but he said, like last week, he said it was just laying in bed thinking about that pain and having to live with that pain for the rest of his life. Yeah, well, the first one was amputated because of that, you know, lack of blood flow in the bed sores or pressure sores that wouldn't heal and everything. And we talked a long time with the doctor. Um, he mentioned amputation, but, you know, we just put that off. And finally, one day I just said to him, I said, if this was your dad, what would you do? And he said, I'd amputate. <laughs> so that happened. I mean, and, and Jim always had hopes of being able to walk again. I mean, he even talked about, you know, well, maybe I could get um, a prosthesis. I mean, he was so hopeful. And it just never happened. Everything. And then the second one with the broken leg. No, he had to have that amputated, too. Just the portion that's left, and it's, it's especially the right leg that does the up and down. Did Jim ever take another step after he was paralyzed? Um, when he was in rehab at Peterson, when they hooked him up to a thing that elevated him in the air and he was all trust in. And even, like, I remember one day, his all of a sudden his right leg crossed over his left leg and everybody there just applauded for him. And we thought, oh, he's on his way, you know. And it wasn't, he'll tell you the story about the. Foster, who talked to him about, oh, it's such a nice day out. It's beautiful outside, and you know you're never going to walk again. He said, you know, she just put that in there, he said, you know, so nicely.